pretty early on in the draft process, I was watching Tyson Campbell and Georgia had this linebacker that was making like every single tackle and I looked him up and it was Monty Rice. And after watching his film, he became one of the first sort of under the radar guys that I was banging the table for this year, not necessarily for the Titans, but just as a player in general. So when Tennessee drafted him and the fan base didn't really like the pick, I sort of went into defense mode and started trying to tell people like, Monty Rice is a really good linebacker. And I don't think the fan base's negative reaction had anything to do with Rice as a player. I think it was more of just collective frustration that they weren't drafting a receiver. And I agree, I don't think they did close to enough to address that position. But putting all that aside, let's talk about Monty Rice as a player. So Monty Rice, first of all, has phenomenal speed for the linebacker position. He ran a 4.57, but that even seems slow compared to how fast he plays. He has reps where he's keeping up with Jalen Waddell and Devontae Smith step for step on deep crossing routes. And there's times even against SEC opponents that he looks like he's the fastest guy on the field. He's also been one of the most secure tacklers in college football throughout his entire career. If we compare his tackling numbers to the linebackers drafted ahead of him, he has the fewest number of missed tackles, the second lowest missed tackle percentage, and the second highest PFF tackling grade. His tackling consistency is even more impressive when you consider his aggressive play style and the fact that a lot of those tackles came off of downhill pursuit where he was less likely to really have time to square up and form tackle. His average tackle depth was only 1.3 yards past the line of scrimmage, so he's a linebacker that's really proactive about finding the ball carrier. He's only 235 pounds, but he's a lot better at taking on blocks than most linebackers his size. He does a good job of shifting his body to create a smaller target and evade blocks without running away from them or running around them. But he's also really physical and he has good shed technique when he needs to engage with blocks. He's not an elite cover linebacker, but he's better than most college players. He's never lost in zone coverage, and he has the athletic traits to be reliable in man. And as far as man coverage goes, he has some good reps and some bad reps, but overall I think he's a really reliable coverage player. He's also extremely versatile, and Kirby Smart deployed him in a bunch of different ways defensively. Rice was used on a ton of blitzes, most of which involved a three technique rushing the A gap to give Rice a clean release through the B gap. Georgia also used him a lot as a spy defender and he would do a great job of kind of darting around the pocket to keep contain while also inching closer to the quarterback to apply pressure. He would set the edge as a Sam linebacker, he'd cover receivers from the slot, he'd play dime linebacker, and the Kirby Smart Nick Saban defense that plays legitimately every coverage, every front, every blitz, Monty Rice played and exceeded at about every single role. He's a player with a ton of versatility, but not in the sense that he's this hybrid linebacker that's going to struggle to find a role in the NFL. Even with all of Monty Rice's strengths that I've just mentioned, what stands out to me as his best trait is his play recognition combined with his ability to adapt to what an offense is doing. I want to start with a sequence of plays from the 2019 SEC Championship game that really puts this trait on full display. On the first play of the game, Georgia's in a tight front out of dime personnel. So in a tight front, the nose tackle is covering the center at a zero technique, and both defensive ends are in a four eye, meaning they're aligned on the inside shoulder of the tackles. This front is built on the idea of shutting down runs to the inside. The defensive ends are responsible for closing off the B gaps, and the nose tackle will have one of a few assignments, but one of the A gaps will be taken care of regardless. These three down linemen mainly just have gap clogging responsibilities and the linebackers or linebacker in this case is responsible for cleaning up runs at the front three force outside. Since the linebacker is tasked with making the tackle, he's going to be the primary point of attack for a running game. If any lineman is able to block Monty Rice at the second level and the other linemen win their double team blocks, then the running back will have pretty much no resistance. LSU runs his zone read and double teams the play side defensive end and the nose tackle. Once the double team on the nose tackle is secured, the backside guard moves to the second level to block the linebacker, in this case Monty Rice. Like I mentioned, there's a few different assignments a nose tackle could have in a tight front, and the linebacker's role changes depending on that assignment. 
Kirby Smart has his nose tackles play what's called a push technique, where they're responsible for the A gap to whatever side the center takes his first step, and he does this to prevent the center from easily moving on to the second level. Rice is then responsible for whichever A gap the nose tackle doesn't take. In every defensive play I charted from Georgia's defense out of a tight front, they set the nose in the exact same way, and I'm guessing LSU noticed that too, because in this game they made a point to attack that tendency. They always sent the backside guard to the second level, knowing that the nose tackle would be pushing play side, and the linebacker would be covering the backside A gap, setting up a really easy angle for the second level block. Even though Edwards Hilaire bounced outside before the guard was able to make contact with Rice, Georgia's defense did exactly what LSU expected. The next time Georgia showed a tight front, which was just a few plays later, LSU went back to the inside zone, which they knew they could get a huge gain off of if everyone just won their blocks. The backside end is able to penetrate and make a stop, but again the nose tackle pushed play side and Monty Rice hovered around the backside A gap, giving the guard an easy target. At this point, LSU's thinking, okay, they've done exactly what we've expected both times. If we just keep running inside zone whenever they're in a tight front, we'll break off a big play eventually. But Monty Rice realizes what's been happening also, and he recognizes that LSU just isn't sending anyone from the play side in his direction. So the next time George is in tight, shockingly, LSU runs inside zone again, but this time Rice recognizes what LSU's doing. Once he sees the direction of the run, he knows that he can make an easy stop since no one from the play side is coming to the second level, and he knows that if he covers the backside A gap like he's been doing, the guard will be right there to take him out of the play. I'm sure Joe Brady was getting frustrated at this point because they kept trying to get this to work. Anytime Georgia lined up in tight, there was a good chance LSU was going to call essentially the exact same play. Obviously they added different wrinkles, but schematically it was always pretty much identical. They'd flip the formation or move the tight end around or move Edwards Hilaire from weak side to strong side, but the fundamentals were the same. The center steps play side and the nose follows him, the backside guard comes off the double team to block Rice, and Rice sees it coming and evades the block. And the fact that George's nose tackle never changed his technique in these situations lets me know that this wasn't a coaching adjustment, it was just something Monty Rice recognized. If a coach realized the opposing offense was trying to exploit one of his tendencies, it would be way easier to just abandon that tendency than to have your dime linebacker two gap five yards down the field. This sort of chess match that Rice was playing with LSU is just one example, but it epitomizes Monty Rice as a player, and it shows up in almost every aspect of his game. Even on relatively simple stuff like being early to recognizing a pulling guard, not really ever falling for any type of misdirection, he's just as steady as they come as far as patrolling the middle of the field. But his athleticism takes him from being a solid, sort of forgettable Mike linebacker to being an actual high-level playmaker. When he sees a player leak out of the formation or he recognizes that one guy's going in the opposite direction of the blocking, he picks up on it and a lot of times single-handedly shuts the play down. So thinking about this pick more broadly as it relates to Tennessee's team building strategy, I think a lot of people think about drafting for need in the wrong way. The draft shouldn't just be where you sort of go down the shopping list and check off all the boxes because a team's needs can change pretty dramatically in one year and I think it's smart to invest in positions before they become needs. If we look ahead to next offseason, Tennessee has about 25 mil in cap space with Ben Jones, Jayon, Rashawn, Landry, and Ferkser all set to be free agents. So let's say we extend Ben Jones at six and a half. Now we're at 18 mil in cap space. Assuming Jayon stays healthy and has a good year, I think about 10 million is reasonable for him. And I don't think it's likely that we re-sign Rashawn Evans. And then edge rushers make a ton of money, so I think 12 is about the floor for Harold Landry. And let's say we give Ferkser four and a half. So at this point, we're $8 million in the red, and we haven't even mentioned other free agents from other teams that we might want to sign. But with Monty Rice entering his second year, plus David Long, who's been pretty good, all of a sudden we're in a much more flexible position where we have the option to let Jay on walk and stay cheap at linebacker. Regardless of how the specifics play out, I think it's important to look at drafts through the lens of multiple years into the future, rather than just look at it as adding players for the next season.